Hey church family, it's JB and I'm here to bring to you the Bible Studies for Life Sunday School lesson for September the 6th, 2020. Uh, as you know, Elkdale, we have started uh, Sunday School back on campus and so if you feel comfortable, you can come uh, to our uh, church building. 8.30 is our first service, 9.45 is our Sunday School hour and for all ages and then 11 o'clock is our second service. And so I invite you to come if when you feel comfortable. We will continue to record Sunday school lessons and we will also continue to live stream our worship services uh, from Elkdale. And so uh, praying for you, we are uh, all uh, together in this uh, pandemic and trying to do uh, the best we can and, and the wisest thing we can and the safest thing we can. We start in a new series, uh, and it starts in uh, Exodus, Exodus 20. You know, uh, Brother Corey, if you missed his sermon series on the Ten Commandments, you can uh, click over to elkdale.org and uh, listen to some of those uh, messages uh, that are archived there and had a great time walking through uh, the Ten Commandments earlier this year. And uh, we, we uh, look to the first uh, few commandments and uh, the, the lesson point of today is to place God first, to place God first. And that is easier said than done, right, church family? And so uh, we're going to dive in to God's word, Exodus 20, and then we're going to skip over to Psalms 16, where David uh, encourages us to, uh, to place God first uh, in his life and also in ours. So let me pray for us and then we'll get started. God, you're good to us. Thank you, Father, for a, a morning where we can uh, look to you. We can look to you as the source of all life. Uh, you are the, the giver of all good gifts, O oh God, and, and you allow us to have access to you, eternal life, uh, by your grace uh, through Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing us to trust in him, to repent of our sins, turn around, and, and march towards him, O oh God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and, and living within us, guiding us to your truth, and allowing us to understand scripture and uh, to love others as we do that. Father, allow us to keep you first in our lives and help us to do that, Holy Spirit. Help us to rely on you and, uh, and, and just um, allow us to do that and so that we could encourage, uh, so that we can worship you and then we can en encourage others. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so Exodus 20, verses uh, 1 through uh, 6 there. But before I, I go there, I want to um, uh, tell you about this story that the, the author um, of this Bible study had said and, and, uh, and, and written down. And he said, a man visited a doctor uh, years ago, and he, um, he said, everywhere I touch, uh, I hurt. I hurt here. I hurt there. I hurt all over. And after he, the doctor had diagnosed the man, he said, you're good. Every, every test that I've run, everything is good except for one thing. Uh, do you know what that one thing is? It was his finger. He had dislocated his finger. And so every time he touched his body everywhere, hurt. And it's not because his body was hurt. It's because of one thing his finger was hurt. And this is where we're going to um, segue into God's word in that if we as Christ followers don't have God first in our lives, then everything else is gonna be um, disorganized. Everything else is gonna be chaos. We need to have, Christ follower, uh, God first in our lives. He's our number one priority. Yes, even before work, even before family, uh, Jesus even said, um, you know, uh, let the dead bury the dead when the man said, hey, I, I want to follow you, but first let me bury my, my dad, uh, that, you know, my family that had passed away. And Jesus said, uh, let the dead bury the dead. And he wasn't meaning that in a, a terrible, um, non-sympathetic sense. He was saying, hey, you need to put God first. You need to follow me first and everything else will um, uh, we'll just, we'll, um, we'll be okay, right? Uh, and so that's where we want to look to Exodus 20 verses 1 through 6. It says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath 
or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the of on the children to the third and fourth generation, to those who hate me, verse six, but showing steadfast love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Um, there's a lot in that. I want to quickly get to the, uh, uh, the commentary of these verses, but when we give uh, to anyone or anything the devotion, the authority, the worship, uh, that God alone deserves. The Bible describes that one, uh, that with one word, and it's called idolatry. It's called idolatry. And so let me skip over to uh, the uh, commentary here. This is a great page. I'm almost going to read the whole thing because the writers have done a, a great job of, of, um, of bringing out uh, the essence of what uh, God's word says. These words, uh, Exodus 20, one through six express God's moral laws, which define how all people of every age should approach God, life, and relationships. And not just uh, those verses, but all the Ten Commandments, right? All of those uh, express that, how we should approach God, life, and relationships. Verse two uh, talks about, I, or says, I am the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord, your God. And anytime you see uh, those capital letters, Lord, it, uh, it tells you that, that that is the proper name of God. That's Yahweh. Uh, so in the Hebrew language uh, and even in the, uh, uh, the, the canon of Scripture in the Torah, uh, the first uh, five books of, of, the, um, of, of the Bible here, they would not write Yahweh um, with the vowels. They would write a capital Y, capital H, capital W, capital H. Uh, and let me find it real quick and make sure. Yeah, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, because they had such reverence for the proper name of God. And I love that, how uh, they would not even uh, write down the word because of the reverence of God. And uh, that just is so um, convicting to me that I, I need to be uh, um, uh, thinking of him. You know, the, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, right? Uh, and so, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is actually how the verse goes. But either way, um, man, that is so good. And how they, they uh, just give such reverence to uh, to God. Uh, the other uh, part of that verse, I am the Lord, Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Okay, so uh, um, uh, Moses is talking through, he's talking through, um, sorry, let me, uh, let me put that on, do not disturb, sorry. Uh, someone else will get it, someone else will get it. So uh, Moses is, is reminding the people, hey, look, this is our God. He's the one that brought us out of slavery, out of slavery, out of Egypt. And so he deserves our worship. Uh, the next verse says, you know, the very first commandment, uh, verse three, you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, very first, out of the gate. Hey, look, I know that there, uh, God knows that there were pagan gods and, and worship was a big thing back there and you have to worship with something, right? You had to have like a, an image in front of you or whatever uh, back then. And, and even now, that's what people want to, they want to see the cross of Christ and they want to see those things. And certainly we can use those in a, in a, in a good way, but that's not who we, that's not what we worship. The cross is not what we worship. It's Jesus. It's Jesus, right? And so, uh, so he was uh, out of the gate. He's telling them, hey, you shall have no other gods before me. The fourth verse, uh, don't make yourself a, a carved image, okay? And I just talked to you about that. Uh, that's what um, the people uh, would do. Um, and so let me read this too. This first command reflects an inward focus related to the heart. Without this heart, commitment to God, uh, with, without this heart, uh, commitment to God, the Israelites would neither have the inclination nor the motivation to obey the other commands. So uh, as I said before, look, this is the first thing you got to get right, right? Is to place God first and everything else uh, flows into that. Even Jesus said, Matthew 22, of all the law, the lawyer was trying to trick him and, and, uh, and, and mess his words up and stuff. 
um, and they said, of all the law, which are the commandments that I need, uh, you know, which is the greatest? What did Jesus say? Uh, Matthew 22, he says, um, you know, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, uh, soul, mind, and strength is the first commandment, and love your neighbor as yourself. And do this, and, uh, and you will fulfill the law. And so, uh, again, uh, love the Lord your God first. Don't make for yourself a carved image. He goes on to say in verses 4 and 5, um, or verse 5 rather, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, uh, for I am the Lord, I the Lord, Yahweh, again, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So again, uh, uh, God is uh, reminding the people there that he is Yahweh. He is the Lord. Uh, he has done this, and so uh, do not bow down to anything else. He says there, hey, I am a jealous God, and, and sometimes we, we look at that and we're like, oh, that's kind of a sin, right? Jealous, Jealousy is a sin. Certainly it's a sin in our minds, right? Um, uh, but anger, anger and other emotions are not sins. It's the action after them. Uh, case in point, uh, Jesus himself would, would be very angry against the people when he came to uh, the temple on Holy Week, right? And he turned tables over and all of those things. And you're like, wow, Jesus um, was uh, definitely angry, right? But he was a righteous angry. And he was, he was angry on behalf of the Father, right? Because they were making uh, the temple uh, a den of thieves, right? And so you can be angry, you can be jealous without sinning. And here's what God is saying here. He is zealous. He's deeply devoted to us. He loves us. And that's what he's saying. So don't have any other gods before me, is what God says there. I love this part where... Uh, well, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. Visiting the iniquity, the sin of the fathers on the, on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And then he goes on to say, verse 6, but showing steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So this is not uh, directly, uh, you know, out, my children and my children's children are not directly going to be punished because I sinned against God or because, you know, I, I didn't obey or, or whatever, right? But indirectly, they will be punished. Indirectly, uh, my children and the children after, uh, my children's children and so on, will be indirectly um, affected by my faith, by my obedience to God. And here's why. I remind youth parents all the time, and I will say any parents, here's, here's what I remind them. You are the primary spiritual emphasis in your home. It's you. It's you, parent. It's you. And so you have direct responsibility over that child to show him the way that he should go, right? And so once he gets to a, a, of age, uh, of, of age of considering God and all of these things, that's not where you stop, but that child has to own their faith. And so they don't get their faith from you per se, or they don't get their salvation from you per se, right? Or they definitely don't, right? That's, that's not of the Bible. They have to own their own faith. They have to decide with their mind, with their heart, that they uh, are a sinner and they're headed for hell justly, uh, but because of Christ, because of the sacrifice uh, that he paid our sins in full on the cross and was uh, buried, uh, died, buried, and resurrected uh, three days later, that he beat the grave and that he beat evil once and for all. Uh, his righteousness for our unrighteousness. And we take that on. He allows us to, to, um, to be forgiven and to live and trust and obey him. And so that child has to make that decision on their own. But parents, we are the ones to lead them to that, right? We lead them by example. We show them. We meditate on God's word day and night is what Psalms 1 would say. Uh, and so uh, that's what we need to do. And so that's exactly why the, uh, the, the God says the, the, he, he visits the iniquity of the fathers uh, on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. There is a continual pattern, right, for not obeying, for not believing, for not putting God first in your life. And so let that be a warning to us. Uh, certainly I'm looking in the mirror uh, to myself that I need to place God first 
uh, um, in my life, uh, but then for my children and their children. Uh, and I love that. He says, hey, showing steadfast love to the thousands of generations. Now the subscript there uh, with the study notes of those who love me and keep my commandments. Man, uh, I am so thankful. I am one of those thousands uh, of generations later uh, and a few generations later that my mom and my grandparents and their parents and grandparents love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Did they mess up? Absolutely. But I am, the, I am benefiting now uh, from those generations of faith. Isn't that sweet? And that is so sweet uh, to think through uh, uh, of that there, and I could talk about that all day. I want to go back to um, question two in the study here. It says, where do you see examples of idols in a typical home in our culture? Where do you see exam uh, examples of idols in a typical home in our culture? We don't have golden calves and all of these things. What we do have is self, right? We think about ourselves all the time, and that's an idol. Uh, we think about our needs, my stuff. It's all about me, right? Um, we uh, think about money, think about cash, you know, and, and, and the love, the root of evil is the love of money, right? The love of money is the root of evil. And so uh, not, uh, not money is the root of evil, okay? But the love of money is what the scriptures say. And so money is an idol. Status, status, a reputation, those kinds of things are idols in, a, in our culture, in our life. Uh, definitely sports stars, um, hoarding stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on to you, okay? Hoarding stuff, possessions. Possessions are forms of idols um, or maybe that one special possession that you have. Uh, man, God should be first in our lives. Uh, there, there should be, it should be God and then a huge chasm and then, uh, and then your family, right? Uh, as a husband, uh, you know, God, huge chasm, huge and then, uh, you know, Summer Brown, my wife, right? And, and, um, and so, anyways, we need to get the, the first things first. We need to get organized in this. This is what this study is about. Um, so, uh, how do things in our lives become idols? And I think the scripture is very clear that when, when good things become God things, that's when they become idols. When good things become God things. When you think about, when you fixate on uh, that good thing, okay? Um, that's when it becomes a God thing, okay? A, a little G God thing. And we should have no other gods before him. Um, I, I wrote down in my notes, religious people do this terribly. We do this terribly. And we have judgment. We pass judgment on others. Uh, and, and listen, you have every right to judge me, Christ follower, because I'm a Christ follower. You have every right to judge me in love and gentleness, right? And I, and I do the same to you. Now, in our culture, we do not do good with confrontation, and we don't like to be told no, right? Uh, we don't like to submit. Uh, but, but you have every right to do that by Scripture, uh, and, and I do for you. And so we need to look out for each other uh, but not pass judgment um, when there's a big log in our eye, right? How can we take the plank out of someone else's eye when we have a log in ours, is what uh, Jesus would say. And so, um, so we do this terribly. Um, so uh, let's go on uh, to Psalm 16, verses 1 through 4. If, uh, uh, God is to be first because he alone is God. We will see in Psalm 16 that God is to be first because he alone is good and completely trustworthy. Now, uh, one of your favorite uh, Bible characters I know uh, is uh, King David, okay? Uh, so David and Goliath, um, David, uh, um, Saul's sons, uh, Jonathan's best friend, uh, David, um, David the shepherd boy, right? Uh, uh, king David, uh, the second king of Israel, and the one after God's own heart. Uh, David uh, has an amazing testimony, amazing story. He also screwed up, right? He, he committed a, 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 a very serious um, sin of adultery. And he also killed, uh, had a man killed, uh, murdered, uh, be trying to cover that sin up. Right, And so David didn't fall from grace, but he certainly did not obey God fully in that. Yet, God still calls him a man after God's uh, own heart. And so, uh, so we, can, we can learn from David uh, definitely. Look at Psalm 16, uh, verses 1 through 4. Okay, Preserve me, O God, 
for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Verse four, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take the names um, on my lips. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move to uh, Psalm 16. So as you turn to Psalm 16, uh, verses one through four, I uh, just want to remind you that uh, this is a psalm from David, uh, from King David. You may remember uh, um, probably one of your favorite uh, Bible uh, people is, is King David, the shepherd boy who would uh, slay Goliath uh, with uh, some rocks and his sling and then be anointed king uh, of Israel. Uh, and then years later, uh, you know, assume uh, the kingdom after uh, hiding from King Saul and uh, just a, a myriad of things. Uh, he was definitely in some treacherous times, uh, much like ourselves uh, today in a pandemic and things. David knew uh, of hiding. He knew of, of being scared and being fearful. Uh, he knew uh, he was a great man of battle, right? Um, so, uh, the scriptures say, uh, the, the people would say Saul would kill his thousands and David his ten thousands, right? And David was a great man, uh, a great warrior. Uh, and so um, let, let's uh, turn to Psalm 16, uh, verses one through four. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Again, uh, right there, I say to the Lord, to Yahweh, the uh, capitalized Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Verse three, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Verse four, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. And so David was able to highlight a big distinction here. One, uh, that uh, God alone is good, okay? God alone is good. And he even, uh, he even says that in verse two, uh, I have no good apart from you, right? Um, a lot of things may not seem good to us, but God uses them to usher in good, okay? And so God can use, God is using this pandemic. There's been a lot of things, good things that have come out of this pandemic. One of those things is we've had quality time with family, right? Uh, uh, some of us, uh, definitely some of us have not had quality time with our loved ones in nursing homes and things like that, and that's been very tragic, uh, right? But we've been able to call uh, and, and send letters and, and those types of things, there are good things that come out of uh, bad things, and God can work those things um, to his good. Um, yet, because of our limited finite understanding, uh, the evil one, Satan, seeks to use uh, things to plant doubt in our hearts concerning God's goodness. So let me look at a couple things from the commentary of Psalms uh, 16, 1 through 4. Uh, from, from David's writings and his lifestyle, we discovered that he knew God in a way that many people would never know God. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart, is what uh, Scripture would say. And even though David uh, did some horrible things, right? He, was, um, uh, he committed adultery, right? And he committed murder uh, in that same um, uh, uh, story there. Uh, David did a lot of things uh, that were not good, yet uh, God uh, wrote down a couple times, uh, 1 Samuel 13, 14, that David was described as a man after God's own heart, and in Acts uh, chapter 13, verse 22. David was definitely a warrior. We talked about that before. Uh, and so David was okay for asking a holy God to protect him right, to protect him in battle, protect him in those uh, ways, and so that's okay, right? That's okay, Christ follower. We can ask God for a hedge of protection or for protection, right? Um, a refuge, look at uh, verse one, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. A refuge 
is a trusted place of protection during times of distress. While some Israelites sought safety in false gods or in foreign countries, the only trustworthy and consistent refuge is found in God. And this is what uh, David is saying there. Verse 2, David did not go to God only when he needed something, but his relationship with God was growing and ongoing. He recognized Yahweh there. So I say to the Lord, to Yahweh, you are my Lord. You're my king. You're my master. I have no good apart from you. Uh, Man, that is so good. And that was very honest. And, uh, you know, King David, and I'm not sure when this was written, but David had all kinds of things, right? Possessions, um, um, all kinds of, of, of things, worldly things. And uh, he, he had um, prestige and uh, uh, titles and lands and all of these things. Yet, he says right there, you are my Lord, God. I have no good apart from you. Man, that is so good. And guess what, Christ follower? We have the same God that he was calling out to. We have the same God he was praying to and praising there. Uh, Amen. Uh, The personal nature of God's covenant relationship with Israel and his self-existence was the good that David talks about. God is the supreme authority over all that exists. David, uh, David's use of this and of his name reflects his submission to God as his master and his reverence for him as sovereign over all creation. God is first. We need to place him first in our lives. Uh, Verse three, after reflecting on the uniqueness of God, David thought about the holy people. Um, uh, In verse three, it says, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom all is my delight. He delighted in seeing uh, the the ones that that were righteous, that would follow God and submit to him he delighted in seeing their obedience. Their, their, and they were excellent at it. They were very good at that. David clarified that he was referring to those who are in the land, most likely referring to the Israelites who were set apart uh, by God and trusted in him. Because the Israelites were God's holy people, separated from the world, God expected them to conform their behavior to his standards. And, and we definitely just, just read of uh, some of the Ten Commandments. Those were the standards, right? Right? We need to, and even even more so, the New Testament would say, uh, and the Old Testament, be holy uh, because I am holy, right? And so that's our standard. Holiness is our standard. Praise God that we have his holiness, his righteousness in Jesus who would come and die for us in our place um, and allow us to live. Uh, and so uh, that that is what we strive to uh, to do, to attain. We're not going to attain it until he, he uh, calls us out and, and uh, perfects us in heaven, uh, uh, but uh, that's what we strive uh, to do. That's what we strive to have good works. We strive to, to be excellent in those things. It's a fruit of our salvation, okay? It's not, you don't get salvation from works, but from salvation, from your trusting belief, your repentance, your forgiveness, uh, from uh, a holy God, th- then you have those good works is um, what uh, Pastor Corey has been talking about with this assurance of salvation in uh, 1 John. And so those are really good things. Uh, verse four, uh, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply their drink offerings of blood. I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. Uh, David's very clear there that, uh, look, uh, those that are faithful, um, uh, to another God or whatever, um, that's not me, okay? And, and we, will, we will not do this. Um, the people that he references is, is the folks that, that have um, pagan, uh, that are pagan nations, right? They worship false gods and things um, like that. And he also says there, look, uh, the, those sorrows of those who run after the, another God, they shall multiply. They shall multiply. And so he's seen it with his own eyes. Uh, the, the recap there of these first four verses, uh, if something is good, its source is God. If something is good, its source is God. And I think that's a, a, brilliant, a brilliant thing there. Um, here's a question, question number four. When, when are you most tempted to put your trust in something besides the Lord? That's a great question. When are you most tempted to put your trust in something 
besides the Lord. And I think that's when we're weak, right? I think that's when we're not walking in God's word. We're, we're kind of missing our devotional times, our, our soul care, our time with God. Uh, when we're missing community, a fellowship of believers, right? When we're, it's easier to uh, stay away from the church gathering or uh, stay away from those that are like-minded encouragers in the faith um, each time. Uh, right? Like the first time it's hard to miss, right? It's hard to miss a gathering. And then the second time it's a little easier. Third time, by the fourth time, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like you never went. Uh, and so, um, so I'm putting pressure on you, not because, um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable coming to uh, worship with us, you can certainly worship uh, by, uh, you know, online and things like that. But really consider that. When's the last time you talked to uh, Christ follower. When's the last time you were encouraged? And so we need to gather together. Uh, if we can't do it physically, we need to do it emotionally, right? And uh, and through the telephone and things like that. Uh, so uh, we need to be surrounded by encouragement. The last verses is uh, Psalm 16 verses 5 through 11. We see that God is to be first because he alone is the way to eternal life. He alone is the way to eternal life. Look at Psalm 16. Uh, we're going to pick up in 5, okay? Verse 5. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Verse 7. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I know that your um, study, your book says uh, just um, verses 9 through 11, but I wanted to read all of that. Because I think it, those are, it's a beautiful passage in uh, seeing the first verse there, verse 5. The Lord, uh, again, Yahweh, is my chosen portion and my cup. It, it would seem that David has, has uh, chosen uh, to love God, right? He's chosen to, uh, to revere God as holy, revere God as first place in his life. And Christ follower, that's what we need to do continually, right? We need to place him first in our lives. Uh, and I, I love that. He says, you hold my lot. You hold everything together. You hold me, right? The lines have fallen for me in verse six in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. And I love uh, 1 Peter 1 where it talks about the, the uh, unfading, imperishable inheritance that we uh, get to uh, have uh, because of Jesus, because of Jesus's love, his sacrifice for us. So uh, that, that's a beautiful, a beautiful passage there that David is uh, considering and claiming there. He says in seven, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. Uh, and so uh, he is leaning on God with all he has. Now, verse eight, I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. At my right hand signifies he's, he's at my place of honor. Also, he's my right hand man right? Uh, not that God is, is man or Yahweh is man, but that he, he listens to that one on his right. He listens to, he is instructed uh, in, the, in the verse before it. He, the Lord, Yahweh, gives me counsel, and so uh, he will not be shaken because uh, God is, is first in his life. Therefore, he says in verse 9, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My whole being, even in sad times, even in those times of distress, of anxiety, all of these things going on, David says, David says, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices because God is good. God is faithful and God is for us. My flesh also dwells secure. Again, he's talking about, uh, you know, being a warrior. He's talking about maybe um, uh, him being a, uh, 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 an older, older king now, an older man. Uh, he still says, hey, you know what? Even though my flesh fails or even though it's weakening, uh, God has made me secure. Um, there was something in the, um, in the commentary that says, uh, that's talking about this security um, or this, this Hebrew term secure. 
it means to put confidence in, to trust and rely on. And so uh, my flesh also dwells secure, not just for safety in these, but that he, he puts all, his whole body trusts in the Lord. His whole being trusts in the Lord. Because God was a priority of his life, he did not fear anything that came in either in this life or in death as a great warrior. Verse 10 says, you, uh, For you, you God, will not abandon my soul to Sheol, uh, to, to the grave, um, or let your Holy One see corruption. Now, um, in the commentary, it talks about how uh, Jesus is kind of um, pointing towards the Messiah, is pointing towards Jesus in that, uh, hey, uh, God will not abandon Jesus uh, in the grave, okay? And he certainly did not. I tend to believe that he is, he's thinking through uh, himself, you know, for you, for God will not abandon David or my soul to the grave or let your Holy One see corruption. And, he's, and, um, and maybe he's talking about the Holy One there is what the commentary is saying. Maybe the Holy One is, is Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's, uh, that's correct or not. It's up for interpretation. But what I do know is uh, that God does not let his righteous ones uh, see corruption, that he saves us, that he, uh, he, he prepares a table uh, in the presence of uh, mine enemies is what uh, Psalms 23 says, right? Uh, and, uh, and he's for us. He, he never leaves us. And so that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and then the last, uh, last verse there, you, God, you make known to me the path of life, eternal life. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And as the uh, uh, guys outside are uh, cleaning up our campus and stuff, I'm just going to cut it off there. Um, thank you for listening and uh, for doing Bible study with me. And uh, here's the thing. God is to have first place in every aspect of our life. So in light of this study, what should we do? We should acknowledge that, right? We should acknowledge that God is first, that he is, is foremost. And so God, forgive us if we don't, forgive me if, we don't, if I don't put you there um, all the time and help me to do that. And so, uh, so that is something we can do. Another uh, action point we can do is make a commitment uh, to begin each day by putting God first. You know, Mark 1, uh, 35 and following, it, it says that Jesus, while it was still dark, Jesus wrote, you know, got up and went to a, a quiet, desolate place so that he could commune with God, so that he can have soul care. And so, um, uh, so that's a good thing. So Christ follower, I ask you, when is your soul care? When is your time alone with God? Uh, I think the mornings are the best time for me, at least with preschoolers before everybody's up. It's just a quiet time. And so, but any time is good, okay? So wh whatever time it is, allow time, make time uh, for you and God and, and God's word and prayer. And, uh, and, and consider me in your prayers too. Consider your staff, uh, your church family. Uh, the last thing is track. It says, keep, consider keeping a notepad or a journal of uh, those, um, those awesome things, those prayers that God um, answers. And that's a wonderful thing to look back and see how he has been so faithful. And he always will be. And so, uh, so church family, thanks for bearing with me uh, through uh, this Sunday school uh, lesson and uh, uh, continue to, um, to seek uh, God's kingdom first and to put him first. And, uh, and, and, and God continues to take care of us. And it's a wonderful thing. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you, God, that we are able to, to look to uh, Old Testament uh, and, and David, God, as he look to you first, and he put you uh, before everything else. I pray, Father, that we are able to do that and do that well, and that it, would be, that it would get easier for us, that we would not be distracted, Lord, from the cares of this world, that we would keep our eyes on, on you, the, the, uh, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And so thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, bye, church family. Have a great week.